good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members uh, may consult tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide papers uh, in a digital format. Agenda item one uh, is to consider whether to take item six in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, agenda item two um, is consideration of two negative instruments. They are the Town and Country Planning Fees for Applications and Deemed Applications Scotland Regulations 2014, that's SSI 2014-214. Uh, and the Building Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-219. Members have a paper from the clerk setting out the purpose of the instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered these instruments and had no comments to make on them. Do members have any comments to make on these instruments? Uh, are we agreed to, uh, not to make any recommendation to the Parliament on either of these instruments? Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item three is our first oral evidence session as part of stage one scrutiny of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. Uh, we have decided to start this process by holding a round table session with key stakeholders to set the scene for this work. Uh, as many of you may know, the committee has used its work programme over the last two years to examine key policy areas relevant to this very important piece of legislation. These have included examining public services reform, local elections, non-domestic rates, the community planning system, land use planning, public procurement, community regeneration policy, and most recently, flexibility and autonomy in local government. We have also undertaken a wide programme of public and community engagement, visiting all parts of Scotland. Uh, in the last three years, the committee has undertaken 10 visits and meetings outside Edinburgh, from Shetland to the Scottish borders, uh, and from Ayrshire to Aberdeen. Uh, so I'd like to start by inviting those witnesses we have around the table today to introduce themselves, and we will then move on to the discussion uh, on the bill. Um, and if we could start with you, Mr. Samuel, please. Sure. Eric Samuel, Senior Policy and Learning Manager with the Big Lottery Fund in Scotland. Elma, Elma Murray, Chief Executive of the North Ayrshire Council and representing Solace. I'm Ian Cook. I'm the Director of the Development Trust Association Scotland. David O'Neill, President of COSLA. Uh, Harry McGuigan, North Lanarkshire Councillor and the uh, COSLA spokesperson. Annette Hastings, I'm Professor of Urban Studies at the University of Glasgow. Uh, I'm Angus Hardy, Director of Scottish Community Alliance. Pauline Douglas, Head of Operations in Scotland for the Caulfield Regeneration Trust. Callum Irving, Chief Executive of Voluntary Action Scotland. Uh, Felix Spittle, Policy Officer at Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Barry McCulloch, Senior Policy Advisor at the Federation of Small Businesses. Thank you. Uh, you're all very uh, welcome. Um, if I can maybe start off, uh, the Minister has said that legislation will not be enough in itself to deliver community empowerment. Uh, and uh, I'm, I've always been of the opinion that sometimes you can legislate for things um, and sometimes a bit of gumption, a bit of common sense is required. Uh, one of the things which we are keen to ensure um, is that uh, as many people as possible um, are engaged in processes. Professor Hastings, if I can maybe start with you, because you've done uh, a fair bit of work with disadvantaged communities and, and, and engagement. How can we ensure um, that uh, this legislation and hopefully the common sense that goes behind it uh, will ensure that folks in disadvantaged communities have their say? Um, I think a first step is to recognise it as a problem in the legislation as an issue and to explicitly state that this legislation um, an, un an, un an, un an unintended consequence of this legislation should not be to empower those who already are advantaged and empowered in society. So I think a symbolic statement in the legislation would give a, an important steer um, to suggest that that shouldn't happen because I guess I have concerns that there are insufficient safeguards in what's currently proposed to um, ensure that um, additional support and um, positive discrimination is afforded to more disadvantaged groups. Um, there's 
a considerable body of research evidence which is growing all the time that um, more affluent social groups have the necessary skills and cultural and social capital to take advantage of opportunities that are put before them. And I think there's a clear case for suggesting that we need to take deliberate strategic action um, to ensure that more disadvantaged groups can avail themselves of the opportunities that are undoubtedly present in the Bill. Uh, a symbolic statement. Uh, you mean a statement of intent statement. rather than something that's symbolic. Well, Does okay. anybody else have any other comments in terms of ensuring that we engage uh, folks from more disadvantaged communities? David? The unprecedented turnout that we saw last Thursday was also replicated in disadvantaged communities. I mean, albeit that the turnout was slightly lower in disadvantaged communities, we did still get a massive increase. We must take advantage of the fact that people did engage in that process. And it would be a real shame if we were to just let that, that advantage, that engagement that we did see last week, if we let that slip away. Anyone else? Uh, Callum, please. I think, I think one of the things that would build on, on what David's just said is that um, one of the reasons why we saw that big turnout and an increase in citizen activism, I think, is the feeling that they could have an influence in that vote. And I think that would be, for me, would be one of the key targets in terms of writing that into this bill. So expectations, not just on outcomes, but expectations that can be assessed against how people have been involved. Has there been a, a way in which the statutory sector has led to greater involvement? One of the things we've said about the bill is that it shouldn't conflate in a kind of casual way um, the third sector and much more empowering citizen-based processes. That's a disservice to both communities and the third sector both need to be clarified and separated out in the bill and I think capacity building particularly focused on, uh, on engagement and participation. Okay. Uh, Angus, please. Um, should I push that? No. Um, as the Minister said, the bill in itself was not going to be enough and um, in order to avoid this kind of syndrome of sharp elbows where the more able, higher capacity communities um, are the ones that advantage uh, most from the bill. And then we've got to make sure that there are resources allocated fairly soon to uh, build capacity uh, in these communities. And I don't mean because in the past we've, we've invested a lot, the, country, the, the government has invested a lot in, in capacity building um, and it's not uh, frankly worked. And I think we've got to look at how we can change our approach towards building capacity in the most disadvantaged communities so that it actually makes an impact and it changes the normal pattern which is that these communities are the last to really benefit. So I, th I think we need to change our approach in, in, term, in relation to capacity building. Pauline? Um, I think the phrase that I used was they don't know what they don't know so we have to help the communities understand that they can be involved and that they will be listened to and point them in the direction and offer that help and support and I think I'm just reiterating what everybody else has said how can we help these communities the more disadvantaged people in the communities um, to become involved and take part thank you uh, we've obviously seen over um, the past few weeks and months as, as David has rightly said um, a rebirth of things like uh, town hall meetings and the establishment of grassroots groups which happened on both sides of, of the, the referendum debate. Um, so I, I think maybe we have some hope there if we grasp that and continue on with that we may, we may go some, somewhere. Uh, Stuart? Thank you, Convener. Excuse my throat, everyone. Um, just it's two uh, very brief points. What, the first one to Councillor O'Neill. Uh, so I'm very much aware that in some of the more uh, dis uh, disadvantaged communities, uh, turnouts actually, uh, last week, turnouts actually were a lot higher as compared to some of the more affluent or, or middle class areas. Uh, but except a question for Mr Hardy, just in terms of Mr Hardy's comments a moment ago, uh, how would, uh, how does, what, what suggestions does he have uh, or his organisation actually have to really kind of take these, uh, these, uh, these issues forward? Well, I mean, this is a very complicated area, I think. But one, what, in, in, in terms of approach, I think we could do much more around um, peer support. So in other words, communities that have already developed uh, their own capacity, I think they could be um, harnessed uh, much more effectively in supporting other communities. I think 
Traditionally, what we do is we, we come in in a kind of top-down fashion into communities and deliver programmes of, of capacity building. And my feeling is that these generally miss the mark. So I think we should be looking much more around peer support, peer mentoring, um, or at least begin to try that, because that doesn't happen at the moment. Eric, please. Yeah, the committee will we give your submission about uh, attached to our submission details of our hour place initiative, which I think you're aware of. We're into the second phase of that, and, and uh, which we, under both phases, we put support contractors in. Um, this time we're taking very much an asset-based development approach to this, so it is building on the assets, and that's what the support contractors will be there to do, build on the assets that these communities already have. Um, we discovered from round one, though, that we had initially thought it would be a two-year process. It turned into a three-year process, and so in our place, uh, two, we're leaving these people in there for even longer, for five years, and the first phase will be very much to work with these communities, um, not just to leave them, and then we'll think about you know, the vision that these communities come up with and working towards that in the second phase. So it can be done, but it takes time and it takes resources. Stuart, did you want to come back? Thank you. Um, Mark, please. I wonder, um, we, we talk about community capacity. I mean, certainly in, in my own constituency, you know, less, um, well, probably the sort of deprived or regeneration communities, there is a huge amount going on within the community. Um, I think what sometimes we mean by community capacity is maybe uh, in terms of professional expertise that exists within that community. For example, in some of the more affluent areas, you are more likely to have people you know, be able to call upon, for example, solicitors or, or, or other professionals um, which are, are less available in our more disadvantaged communities to support the, the community organisations that exist. So is it... Is it as much about getting communities to build that capacity in terms of activism? Because I detect in, in the areas that I represent that that activism of, of community is alive. Or is it about having a support base there for those community groups and organisations that already exist? And if so, how do we supplant that into those communities where the people to fill those roles don't exist within the communities themselves? Whereas I, I agree very much with the, um, the, the suggestions around building capacity from, from the bottom up, I think that there's also a role for thinking about more top-down solutions to, to this problem as well. I have a particular concern that when community bodies come forward requesting improvements and outcomes in relation to their service, that those out, particularly in the, in the era of austerity with resources being particularly tight, that outcomes could be improved for one community at the direct expense of another community. And I'd like to suggest that the, the, right, the, the right to request participation um, is the, the, the process that's developed um, makes a requirement on public bodies to um, consider displacement effects um, on other communities from resulting from improving the outcomes for one community. Conversation. I was reflecting on um, maybe three examples to maybe help the committee's deliberations on this. Um, I agree fully with the uh, comments around asset-based approaches, and <clears throat> a lot of that is about building local community confidence and people's um, confidence in being able to step up and, and bring forward their own ideas, their own solutions, and being able to um, articulate the case for why they, they require that support. To, to get a lot of our communities to that position and the people in those communities to that position, you do, as Professor Hastings has suggested, require to provide them with some, um, I guess, upfront support. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't call it necessarily top down as, as, as going in and uh, working with them. Um, and, and providing them with that excess capacity. And we, we've done that in a number of communities across Scotland, and it is very much about this asset-based approach. So I would agree with that, and that's one, one example that I think the committee could use quite um, helpfully. Um, I also think that, there's a, that we should be using opportunities as they present themselves to us. So if you take, for example, um, the significant success that Scotland's had this year with Commonwealth Games, and the number of communities across Scotland that got involved in the Commonwealth Games, um, perhaps through the Queen's Baton really as it was going through their particular community, where they were organising and empowering themselves to have particular celebrations of local heroes and local events 
Um, and, and I guess um, thinking about what the Commonwealth Games actually meant for them in their local area. And uh, again, I found that to be hugely important in build, building that community, that sense of community empowerment and people's confidence about what they can do for themselves. And the other example that I thought I would just, just mention to the committee today is, again, a lot of work is going on across Scotland on parenting approaches. And um, this, this is not about um, bringing people in with uh, a lot of professional uh, skills, but it's about, again, uh, picking almost, or finding, almost picking is the wrong word, but finding um, people who are prepared to come forward as community and local champions, who are prepared to work with other people who perhaps have just a wee bit less confidence than they have, have in their own community, and um, to help them to feel that they're able to do things that um, a few months or a couple of years ago they had no actual understanding that they could achieve, and to completely change their level of aspiration and ambition within their local community. Mark, I'll come back to you a bit. Can I take in Felix and then Angus first, please? And kind of one of the phrases that really stood out for me from one of the early sessions was communities need expertise on tap, not on top. So it's that, that idea that communities need um, a bit of technical expertise, a bit of organisational support at a very specific time. And they need different levels of support at different uh, stages in their process as they empower themselves. Um, and I think there's a big kind of argument to be made as well for building capacity directly into the organisations that um, communities have identified to take forward their own kind of priorities, their own ambitions. Uh, the Strengthening Communities programme that the Scottish Government is un uh, undertaking at the moment is a good kind of pilot of that approach. But I think that, that needs to be widened out and offered to a lot more communities so that they have the capacity within the organisations that they've chosen. And that's the way that they've chosen to take forward um, the priorities in their area. Thank you. Angus, please. Yeah, I'd absolutely support what you just said. And, and just in response to the issue about um, how we respond to communities that don't have perhaps those... Um, middle class capacities, those skill sets that, that um, other communities might have. I mean, I think that the, the distinction is that we should be um, investing in uh, local leadership, the local activists, uh, and, and giving them the confidence to bring in on their own terms those skills. And that's a, a quite significant difference from um, them being delivered in a, in a top down or upfront uh, fashion. Uh, to a community. If it's coming in on the community's terms, I think that's absolutely fine, and that's what these communities need. But as Felix says, it's, it's on their own terms at the time when they need it along that pathway uh, of, of empowerment. Mark, and then I'll come to Harry and Ian. Yeah, uh, often communities can find that the sort of pathways for support, if you will, are very complicated, and often there are hurdles that they have to overcome, for example, in order to access funding to develop business cases, sometimes that funding needs to be match funding, and for some communities that's easier to achieve than for others. Um, often uh, local authorities can put up barriers for communities in terms of support from their aspects because they can perceive where, for example, the asset that the community wishes to uh, take over as a local authority asset, there can be a perception of a conflict of interest, and often local communities can find that there are barriers put up, some of which may be genuine, some of which may be artificial. And I think, you know, is there a means by which the the landscape for communities, particularly those communities who don't know the places to go, can be made much simpler and much more streamlined so that they know exactly where they can go for the relevant support and we can remove any barriers that might exist which would prevent communities from accessing the support that's out there. OK, I'll take in Harry, first of all, please. Um, maybe I could just uh, relate a little uh, experience that I had a number of years ago, um, and I think we can all learn from it. I certainly learned from it, I hope. Um, but it was a, 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 an occasion where there was a major issues in a particular housing estate in the area that I represented. Um, I went about my business talking to the police, community development officers, social work, all sorts of different people that knew um, the professionals who knew how to go about social planning and social reconstruction. We looked at all the problems and we held a major public meeting in one of the local schools, very, very well attended. Inside five minutes of me standing up to introduce it, um, 
I could see some of the heads already shaking. After 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, I could see lots of the heads going down and shaking. We invited a discussion then because that was clearly um, an expression that was coming. It was a voice, if you like, that was coming from the, 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 the audience there. But we realised, at least I realised quite quickly, that this was because we had consulted with all of the experts and some of the very influential community groups that operated in that particular area. But we hadn't consulted with the real experts. And the real experts were the people who were living in that community, who were experiencing what life really was like in that community. And they were people who had skills, they had understandings, they had knowledge, and they had a, a desire to make a change in their community. But we had forgotten, I had forgotten, to include that voice, that very, very important voice. And I think this is what the, the Empowerment Bill should be about. Um, I, I'm, I'm not surprised at the, the huge turnout for a, uh, the, the, the referendum um, on, on, on Thursday because of the realisation that it was a fairly simple statement that some people wanted to make. Um, and, you know, and, and there are certainly people that were coming out to the polling stations that I had never, never seen before. Um, and they were saying, you know, I'm going in this particular way for a particular reason. I want to see things change. I want to be involved. I want my voice. They weren't saying this individually, but I think collectively there was a statement set that was saying, we want our voice to be heard. We want people to help us hear those voices and understand where we are coming from and I think we've got the expertise to do that but what we don't do and somebody mentioned the pathways we have to be careful that we don't construct a whole set of pathways that look good to the experts but they may not be uh, relevant appropriate or consistent with what's being felt out there in our communities. Thanks. Ian please. Yeah, just really pick up with some of the strands from the conversation I mean, I think if we're discussing community capacity building, it seems to me that what's quite critical, because it's a very sort of wide concept, really, is that we're clear about whose capacity we're talking about building and for what purpose. And I think that's the, the sort of fundamental question that often doesn't precede the discussion, really. So linking that back to the bill and what the bill is trying to achieve, uh, I suppose coming from a sort of DTA Scotland point of view, what our particular interest is and what I understand to be part of the rationale for the bill is how we further community-led regeneration in Scotland. So I think what we're talking about primarily is the idea of building community anchor organisations. So we're talking about community capacity building that builds organisational capacity, and I think sort of Felix touched on that, and we've got examples of where that happens. And linking that back to disadvantaged communities, it does seem to me that we have got some great examples of disadvantaged communities that have got strong community anchor organisations. And I think the point that was made over there about quite often disadvantaged communities have a plethora of small community organisations. The question is, how do we work with them, bring them together to create that kind of strategic community anchor organisation? And that's the task in hand quite often. So I think that there are examples, and we can use the sort of peer support that Angus referred to earlier on. But we also, I think, going back to the original question, as well as capacity building, we've also got to look at the funding and resources which are going to help support the sort of activity that's promoted within the bill. Thank you. Um, I wonder, Barry, obviously the FSB has uh, a huge role in helping uh, businesses become more empowered. Do you think that we could learn anything from the business community in terms of empowerment? Yeah, I, th I think naturally the FSB as a business organisation comes at this issue from a completely different perspective. And the general point that we would make at this stage is that small local businesses constitute a key part of their communities and that shouldn't be forgotten and that the skills and expertise they have can help the wider efforts to regenerate communities. Thank you. Callum, please. Yeah, just a quick point to say that um, when it comes to the third sector and whatever kind of third sector we mean, the third sector interfaces are partly trying to do that job of building the capacity of third sector organisations and to connect them to public policy and help them find a way 
into influencing local decision making, be it with the local authority, health and social care partnerships and so on. But one of the challenges that I think that needs to be considered by this committee is the variable accessibility of the system to that. So it is possible to connect disparate parts of the third sector, but then what influence can that actually have on the system? We find that that varies massively right across the country. Okay. Um, before I bring in Cameron, uh, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate here uh, because we've heard the expressions community anchor organisations, third sector interfaces. Uh, over the years, um, you know, there have been so many uh, different terminologies that have been used when it has uh, come to these things. Um, uh, going back to my own time as the chair of a social inclusion partnership, um, I actually banned some of the gobbledygook phrases. Do you think that these kind of things and the kind of discussion that we're having here uh, often puts folk off uh, from becoming uh, involved in, in their communities because they come, they listen to us um, sometimes and think, what the hell is that all about? I see nods. Ian? Except that point, um, having used the term community anchor and brought it up in the conversation, I mean, I, th I think in our experience, um, I mean, it's a, it's a convenient shorthand, I think, to describe the sort of organisations that we're, we're trying to create without being too prescriptive about what they are. But in our experience, what helps local people understand what it's about is going to visit other communities who are actually doing that, speaking to them, discussing what the kind of common issues are, the common problems, how they've been addressed, what's worked, what's not worked, etc. And to facilitate that kind of just cross-community learning, it does not cost a lot of money. Um, at the moment, we've got a small grant fund for development trust or aspiring development trust to do that. But if that was widened out to include all sorts of community organisations, I think that's how we get around that problem. Please. Yeah, I, I, I agree about, with a lot of what Ian's just said and accept the points that you've, you've made, con convener. Um, I, I think... It's easy for us to, to look at how we would want to organise communities so that we can best engage with them. And I think that's part of the point that you're, you're trying to make. And um, that's probably not how communities would can wish. Maybe, can I maybe interrupt you, uh, Alma? Do you think that maybe we have a difficulty in the fact that it may be others that want to organise communities rather than communities organising themselves into... Uh, areas of work that they want to deal with rather than being pushed into a, a, a box? I, I think for, for reasons of convenience, we probably try to do that so that we can marshal our resources. And I'm not saying that that's acceptable. I'm just saying that I think that, or I see that that's what happens quite often. Um, what, what I was going to go on to say, though, is that... Um, there is a requirement for us to make sure that we marshal the resources that we can make available to assist and support and, and help communities without a doubt. But a lot of that can be much better provided in, in my experience um, through um, a significant amount of building trust with communities because even if the, the structures that we have in place or the organisation that we have in place to help them or the pathways in, in in terms of some of the words that we've used this morning, um, if communities trust us, they will ask questions and we will be able to help them find their way through all of that. So that, that, a lot of that for me is about how we engage with them, building that trust and also, um, I guess, being, being clear about that and, and um, doing a lot of regular and, and uh, authentic uh, consultation uh, with them as well about that. David, please. A number of points, uh, Chair. Uh, if we are going to deal with inequalities, particularly within our disadvantaged communities, that does mean that we are going to have to disadvantage some other communities who are currently doing, doing OK. Uh, I first became aware through the indices of multiple deprivation, the difference in life expectancy within North Ayrshire some years ago, and at that time it was 14 years from our most deprived to our least deprived community. In the intervening period, uh, the, co the community with the longest life expectancy has changed, the community with the shortest life expectancy uh, has remained the same. But instead of being 14 years, it's 24 years. Now, that's inequality going in the wrong direction. 
we need to be willing to tackle that. We also need to be willing to uh, have a, a messy approach. We cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to the solutions within our communities. Communities, in many instances, uh, share problems, but in many other instances, have unique problems. You cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to this. And as Harry said earlier, the best folk to tell you what the solution is are probably the people who actually live there. Uh, now we can help a wee bit uh, with that and uh, putting some, uh, some structure into what, what the solutions are, but by and large it's the people in the communities that know what the, the solutions are. And in terms of language, you're absolutely right, Chair. We do use language which excludes people from, from the discussion. Uh, as part of the work in the, the Commission uh, for Strengthening Local Democracy, we did a, a poll. Polls are very popular, as, as you know. And one of the things that the polls told us was that government is remote from communities. And what they meant by government was national government and local government. And that's partly down to the language that we use. Cameron, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, following on from what the convener and uh, Mr. Bugigan says, we shouldn't be using fancy words for these things because it does uh, disadvantage people. But my real question is, how would you prioritise Scotland's poorest communities? That, I think, is the key to this. I'd like the suggestions. But we shouldn't be using fancy words. OK. Um, Annette, and then Pauline, and then Alec. Annette, please. Um, can I just augment points I've already made, just by, just by sort of drawing a distinction, I think, um, which I think the, the bill is trying to, to deliver. Um, it's, I think it's trying to deliver two, two, two distinctive things. I think it's trying to strengthen what's already there in relation to, to community engagement and um, um, you know, community, community anchor organisations and trying to, to make them more, more, more substantial. So things like the, you know, trans making it easier to transfer assets would be a, an indicator of that. I think it falls short on the strengthening what's already their agenda by not committing to more substantial resources um, for capacity building with those communities which have their voice heard to an extent but could do with more support to make it heard more effectively. So I think that's one intention of the bill. I think there's a separate atten intention, which is to open up new routes and possibilities for people who don't currently have their voice said. Um, and I guess this would be Councillor McGuigan's point. Um, there's a pent-up demand within um, uh, disadvantaged um, areas for routes, out of, for routes to have voices there, um, um, heard. And I'm not sure this bill delivers on that at all. I think what it does deliver on is, is additional routes for the more disadvantaged groups to have their voice heard, and it could be at the expense of more disadvantaged groups. Pauline? Um, the Covid Regeneration Trust, we've been involved with the Our Place programme that um, Eric's spoken about, and we were also involved with Ayrshire 21, and we have a programme of our own which is all about the asset-based approach, which we found just to be a fabulous way of, of working in communities. But I would say that the, the, key, the key area of our work is that of a facilitator. Um, I don't live in all these communities. My staff don't live in these communities. So it is really about trying to get the people in the communities who live there to take forward their ideas and to, to do the work. And um, So really it's about us trying to facilitate that and make sure that they know where to go and all the different things that, that have to make things happen in their community. Okay. Alec? And the discussion, Highland... Council, for example, has raised the omission of community councils in the bill. And I suppose if we're, if we're talking about government being remote, um, this, this, this committee did a piece of work recently looking at local government and looked across Europe and local government in many parts of Europe is far, far more closer to communities than the 32 authorities in Scotland are. And one might argue that whether or not community councils in their current form are successful or not, some are, some are, are, are more than others, um, that you, you possibly have the structure there for a fourth tier of government that, that with real powers and budgets devolved into that area um, would generate interest across communities. And I only throw that in, um, and if it's not community councils, what is it and what about this question of the remoteness? The other point that I wanted to pick up on 
is this point about about consultation and and you know people talk about the turnout last last week but in terms of consultation many people have gone along to consultation meetings held in their local authorities and thought it was a waste of time and and were put off ever going back again and it's this question that's raised by the community development center about engagement and empowerment and, 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 and the difference between those two. And I, I give you a real practical example. In Resyth, in my constituency, there is, there is a house in the state which, when built, somebody had the idea that they would plant all these trees in the grass panels, um, but they probably put the wrong kind of tree in, and now these trees are massive. So in the summertime, the people um, basically don't have any light coming in their windows, and in the winter time on wet days, um, like, like we've had this week, it's actually dangerous with the leaves for the people slitting. And so it seems like common sense to me that the majority of people are saying to me we need to deal with this, but along comes the tree search and then says they're perfectly healthy trees and council policy is that you don't take them out. And for the life of me, I can't understand why, why in an estate, if you were truly impairing that estate, and that was an issue in that estate. And so the danger with this bill is that it's fully a lot of rhetoric, but has little teeth to actually impair anybody to actually do anything about their, the, the issues that, that, that bother them and their local community. And my final point is just back to this, this issue about substantial resources that Annette mentions, and particularly in, in, in poorer communities, because all the evidence would suggest that that um, poverty and social deprivation is a major barrier to people being able to engage. And is there more that we could actually build into this bill to actually address that? I don't apologise for shifting resources to the areas of greatest need. Indeed, if we don't do that, that's why we've seen inequality uh, continue to rise over the last number of years. So I just throw these points in, convener. Okay. Um, I'm going to take Harry, but if you could indicate, indicate if you want to answer any of the points made, that's grand. <coughs> Harry, please. And it probably interfaces with some of what Alec has just said there. Um, we sometimes assume that the well-intending organisations within our communities are indeed reaching and reflecting the, the needs and the aspirations of the communities that, uh, that they speak for. Um, sadly, that isn't always the case. Uh, you know, I have situations where I, I go to, you know, I certainly can think of three local organisations that I attend, um, and the, the, it's, it's the same faces that are at those meetings. Um, they are good people, but if you were to ask, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in some of the areas in my constituency, uh, where the who these people were, who did they represent, they're not known to the wider community at all. So I think what is maybe going to be the hard business here, um, I think it's important to, as you say, Alec, you know, to differentiate between engagement and empowerment. Engagement can happen in all sorts of ways, and sometimes it can be very hollow, but sometimes it can be very fruitful. But the empowerment part is the, is the difficult bit. And I think getting into the communities and connecting with those communities is going to be very, very tough. But we shouldn't shy away from it. We can find ways and means, I think, of improving. Indeed, um, representing COSLA at the Congress of Municipals, Municipalities, um, I, I've been appointed as a rapporteur to look and, try, look and learn um, from what's happening here in Scotland, in, in the UK and across Europe in terms of um, further devolution of uh, power, if you like, communitarianism, wh how it works in different parts of Europe. Um, and that's, that's work I'll be reporting, uh, the, the first stage of that work, um, on the 17th of October, 17th of November, sorry. Um, but I hope that that will be fruitful and, and helpful. But we can learn from looking at what happens in other places. And we shouldn't be afraid of small areas having some power and some control over the factors that affect their lives. And remember, you know, David made the very, very valid point about prioritisation. Of course, we've always got to prioritise. Uh, but we have to remember that in every community, you will find opportunities to enable that community to feel more satisfied with itself because it is being listened to. And that's something we have to try and uh, reach. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Angus, please. 
Um, <clears throat> well, I, I would just very much support what um, Councillor O'Neill said about the nature of community em empowerment and, and communities in, in general being messy, and that we, should, we need to view this, this notion of community empowerment not in any way as a one-size-fits-all, but um, and which is why, in fact, in our evidence, we um, suggested that we, we should try and frame this bill around some first principles that, that we could use as a kind of, almost as a framework to, to, to have a look at the impact of the bill once it's on the books. Because, uh, and, and those principles are, are around subsidiarity, around local people being in control, around assets. Um, and if, you, if, if we did that, then, then I think we would begin to see community empowerment in the round rather than as some kind of um, prescript, prescription that we can use to, to, to sort out uh, the most disadvantaged communities. And, and the other point um, about the remoteness um, of government or the way in which um, government is perceived by communities, I think you could argue that this bill um, is in some ways... Um, a compensatory measure for the, the, the absence of real localised government um, and, and that it's kind of so a, a kind of a risk that the bill uh, is running is that it fits within this vacuum of, of local democracy and you know if, if we had real local democracy as, as um, was touched on by the, the Commission's report I think um, not that the bill wouldn't be needed but it might be different uh, the measures might be different within it. So I think we need to see it in that context, so that it is, it's, it's, it's landing in a, in, a, in a kind of vacuum of local democracy. Felix? Yeah, just to go back to the question about prioritising Scotland's first communities. And I link that with the, the engagement route. I think one of the things that's missing, particularly from this bill, is uh, participatory budging and other participatory approaches, um, citizen juries, etc. I think that kind of approach has the potential to solve a lot of those problems involving people in poor communities and meaningful consultation or participatory events um, would help address those kind of disadvantages that those communities are experiencing and make that engagement more meaningful and start to get to the heart of the kind of Christie Commission recommendations about building public services around people and communities, give them the real say in the decisions about uh, how public services are delivered and where their money is spent. I think the Commission on uh, Local Democracy recommended a, a much greater increase in uh, participation, the establishment of a participation unit in Scotland. So I think the bill could, could assist that process by legislating for participatory approaches, particularly participatory budgeting. Thank you. Stuart, please. Thank you, Mr. Mr. McCulloch from his comments from earlier uh, regarding the FSB. Uh, and I accept the point that, uh, that there are many small businesses within the communities that we're discussing here this morning. Um, but do you see a, a greater role for the FSB and also uh, even larger companies within communities to actually facilitate and help the communities as compared to just uh, being based there? Uh, but potentially not actually having the workforce who come from that particular community. Barry? I think there is a way of role that business can play in local communities, but I don't think we can be prescriptive about it. Um, you know, the, the influence or involvement that businesses may wish to choose is, is defined by scale, size, sector, geography. Um, and it's very difficult to say that A and other business will, will choose to involve, but no, I definitely agree that the skills and the expertise that they have could... Um, contribute to the community approach that we have here. Okay. Anne, please. Thanks, Convener. Um, can I take us now on to the national performance framework aspect of it and the national outcomes? Currently, I, I, and I'm intrigued, um, Councillor Neil had mentioned earlier about the increase um, and poverty as opposed to the decrease after the work had been done. So could I ask um, around the table in what ways does the Scottish Performance and the National Performance Framework currently inform your work? Let's have a crack at that first. I realise that's a pretty complex question. Elma. Thank you, Convener. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I think I would say that um, at a, a local authority level and a community planning partnership level, 
um, the national performance framework and the outcomes from the national performance framework feed directly through to single outcome agreements. So there is something there, but I absolutely accept that that's still quite removed from individual communities in the way that we've been talk discussing them this morning. So there is a link through to community planning partnerships. Um, <clears throat> what I would then go on to say, though, to, to try and then link um, what we do at community planning partnership level with our local communities is that that needs, needs to improve. That is um, starting to improve. We, um, most community planning partnerships now have a very well-defined um, and clear view of each of their neighbourhoods and localities within, within the, their, their community planning area overall and the needs of those localities. So we know where our most disadvantaged areas are. Um, whether it's uh, an area of geography or whether it's an area of need, which might, might not be linked specifically to the geography, but might be um, to particular vulnerabilities with it for individuals within our communities. So we, we understand that clearly, or more clearly than we used to. Um, and I, I think the other uh, way that I was going to, to, to reflect on how this all links up is that... Um, Every area in Scotland is in the process of implementing a new uh, integrated health and social care partnership. And we're all doing a lot of uh, locality planning at the moment to ensure, again, that the needs of specific communities, and particularly the health needs of specific communities, are properly reflected in the way in which we prioritise both our financial and our people resources to, to, to properly try and target those, those uh, individuals and communities. I hope that's, that's helpful, convener. Thank you. David, please. <coughs> uh, in support of what, what Elmer has said, we have had a, a focus over the years on targets, national targets, and it's not something that any one political party has been guilty of. We've all done it. And what that has meant is that we have tried a one-size-fits-all approach for communities, and communities are different. So we're sitting here today, uh, local government, the health service, focused on targets that may not be appropriate for certain communities. We need to get away from this national approach to, to targeting and make it very specific to what communities actually need. Okay, thank you. Add. Do that then through the role of the CPPs and through this bill? Uh, I don't think that this bill probably goes far enough to do that, but the bill, is, in terms of direction of travel, is going in, in, in the right direction. But perhaps that's something your committee would like to, to suggest. Thank you. Harry? Just to add, <coughs> add to that, um, community planning partnerships um, have a long way to go, I think, in some areas and in other areas are better than others. But they are certainly um, one of the, 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 the I think, the, 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 the brightest um, opportunities to really make a difference, to, to utilise the strengths and competencies and institutions that are in your own area, to utilise that to the very best effect. But it cannot be driven by local government alone. There has to be a realisation that the rest of the public sector have a very, very important role and very important sets of responsibilities. And sometimes um, that isn't always um, quite as realised to the extent that it should be. But uh, I do think it's a, we're moving in the right direction of travel. So we still require some cultural change then in public bodies and community bodies in order to make these processes uh, work a little better than they currently do. Do you think the bill will help address some of that uh, cultural change that's required? I certainly, I certainly hope that it will. Um, I'm not so sure that it necessarily will. Um, one of the things I would certainly like to see in the bill is a realisation that local government have a very, very important and crucial role to play in this. And yet local government doesn't have any statutory uh, status at all um, in, 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 uh, in terms of uh, what would be considered to be required status by the European Charter. Um, so, but I, I think we're moving in the right way. But I think local government has to learn that it has to ensure that the voices are being heard at every level. It's got to ensure, I mean, I hear people talk about the, the failure to listen to third sector, voluntary sector, um, 
you know, and, and the mechanisms for um, representation at CPPs or the, 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 the messages you're getting through to the CPPs are not as good as they should be. That has to change. David, please. Uh, Chair, today within the public sector, within the third sector, uh, there is no one who has experienced anything other than a centralisation uh, project. Now, and I emphasise the point once again, this isn't for any one political party. It goes way beyond the lifetime of, of any, any parliament uh, and any one party being involved in it. All the parties have been guilty of it. So there is a culture, there is a mindset that it is better to do things centralised, get it into the centre. We see that most recently with fire and police. And again, three of the four major political parties had that within their manifesto, so it's not a criticism of any, any one, one party. Mm -hmm. But there is this culture that says you get more efficiency if you, uh, if you centralise. You maybe get more financial efficiency, but you get poorer results within our communities doing it that way. Let's get back down to communities, get into the heart of communities, and if that looks messy, so be it. If we get better results for our communities, that's a good thing. Harry mentioned the point about the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Thank you, Harry. If I'd gone back to Cosla without that getting mentioned, I'd have <laughs> get kicked up and doing Princess Street. So uh, that, that is something that we asked the Minister uh, to include within, within the bill. The Minister's response at that time was uh, subject to uh, a yes vote that there would be a written constitution, local government would be protected within that. We uh, know what the, the result of the referendum was, so an opportunity now exists to revisit that and put it within, uh, with, with, within the, uh, the bill, with, within the Act. Why do I say that? Because within living memory, we have seen local government, a whole system of local government, effectively abolished at the whim of a Prime Minister who thought the Strathclyde region had the temerity to stop the privatisation of Scottish water, and our solution to that was to abolish a, a whole system of local government. There is no suggestion in what I'm saying here that anybody's thinking about doing that now. There's not been a single hint about that, but it could happen unless local government is actually enshrined within law. Um, I have three committee members on my list uh, next. Um, if you want to intervene in any of them, please uh, let us know. John, please. Thank you, conveners. Really, just to follow up on <coughs> Ms Murray's comments about the health uh, inequalities and the work that's been done jointly with the health boards. What I picked up from that and uh, the other comment from Councillor McGuigan about institutions, what work is currently being done with those communities to actually develop these services? Because what I, heard, what I picked up from what Ms Murray said is that the the health boards, local authorities and other agencies are still developing strategies from a top-down position. Uh, and what we're trying to do, hopefully, through this Community Empowerment <coughs> Scotland Bill, is actually develop strategies that are inclusive, that listen to and act upon the wishes and aspirations of communities. Because the, really, if we are still talking about strategies while this bill is going through the process, about you know, just top-down approach to delivering services, then surely we are still stuck in a groove that we need to jump out of because we need to make sure that what we're doing, the best, and the best way to deliver services, and I have a number of years of experience of working in deprived communities, uh, is to actually engage fully with those communities and ask those communities what they need, not what you think they deserve or should get it's about what they want and how they actually interact. And there are issues that come out of that in relation to accountability of the people that you're engaging with. But that's another issue for local authorities, uh, CPPs and other agencies to take on board as they develop these strategies. So could someone give me an assurance that things are moving forward, that we're not stuck in the same groove that says we'll continue to make policy at the top level and expect people to actually accept it at the grassroots. Elma, please. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, I apologise to um, Mr Wilson. Um, I think I might have left him with perhaps a bit of a wrong impression, but I'll explain a wee bit more why that's the case. Um, what, what, what we're doing with, with, with communities, not two communities, but with communities just now, is um, not new. How we're doing it is new. Um, so um, the local authority will al always have worked with a range of uh, local uh, stakeholders, local um, uh, interest uh, groups um, with uh, particular representati re representative individuals from some of those, those groups to define and identify how we would be providing services with and for them in their areas. And sometimes it is with and sometimes it's for, depending on their needs. The health board would also be doing that. Um, what's new now and different is that we're now doing that together. Um, so in effect, what we were seeing earlier on today is that um, communities um, can be messy because they're, they're all coming from different places with different needs and different representatives and that uh, sometimes we try to organise them a bit to make it easier for us to help them. And what I'm saying as well, we've actually organised ourselves a bit now as well through the Integrated Health and Social Care Partnership so that we are now organising ourselves to work with our communities, accepting that um, they are coming from um, a, a place that would uh, welcome us being a bit more um, uh, I guess, structured in how we approach them so that they don't need to deal with the health board separately, they don't need to deal with the council separately, but they're, they're working with us jointly. I'd, I think I'd also like to say um, that, uh, and I, I can't speak for, the, for what's happening across Scotland with um, the Integrated Health and Social Care Partnerships, but um, we are um, prescribed through the legislation um, to have uh, integration boards which do take into account a whole range of uh, interests from our local area. Within North Ayrshire, the Integrated Health and Social Care Partnership Board has eight members who are from the, the council and the health board and the other 16 members, so it's a board that's made up of 24 members, the other 16 members come from a whole range of different, different representatives um, from both across the community, but also from staff who are providing those services as well, because very often, um, our staff understand exactly what uh, people need and want because they're, they're working with them day in and day out. Um, so hopefully that gives some clarification. Yeah, can I stop you there? I, I'm sorry if I'm uh, cutting in on John here, but I hark back to a number of years ago where a community I represented in the council at that time um, put their health priority, uh, number one health priority being down as mental health. Uh, when the health board um, and the council, um, their main priority was uh, to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. um, now, the reality is um, that many of those folks would find it very difficult to stop smoking unless some of the mental health problems that they had were gone. Um, can I ask, and I think this is what John was driving at, how do communities themselves manage to get across their priority rather than the priority of the local authority yeah. or the health board or sometimes well-meaning <coughs> uh, frontline staff who quite kind of quite get to grips with what, what the real difficulties yeah. are what are the ends for for communities yeah i i, I, I hear hear the, those those issues as well convener um, in terms of are we um determining our priorities from a top-down or a bottom-up approach um and uh, at the moment, um, I, I guess this link links back to some of the some of the points that were made earlier on about the performance management framework as well that we have in Scotland to provide us with more local flexibility to be able to take into account what communities are saying that they want to be their priorities. Certainly, the the, the communities that we work with, they, they do tell us what they want, and we do listen to that, and we do um, work with them to make those uh, decisions about what we prioritise. Just. It's an interesting end to that response, convener, in terms of we work with the communities to prioritise. Surely what we're trying to do through the Community Empowerment Bill is to try and get the community's priorities yeah. top of the agenda. Yeah. 
So they were actually acting on what, as the convener highlighted, the mental health issue vis-à-vis -vis smoking, and I understand where that argument comes from. If you tackle the mental health issue, then there'd be less need for people to smoke. But it's about trying to ensure, and the, the bill is, has come around as a consequence of the failure of agencies, and that may be Scottish Government, maybe UK Government, local authorities, health boards and others, to actually listen to and act upon the priorities of communities. Because many communities, many deprived communities, their priority may not be to run a community facility. Their priority may be to make sure that every house in the area is up to a tolerable standard and the neighbours are li living next to are actually behaving themselves and they're not causing any social behaviour. So how do we get that turnaround in the thinking of the agencies, authorities and governments to ensure that what we're actually doing is addressing the issues of communities, not addressing the issues that they think communities have and trying to get them to work around their priorities rather than the priorities of the communities themselves. John makes a good point. Um, there has been a frustration, I think, um, certainly um, in the early days as far as uh, CPPs are concerned, because um, there was not always the solidarity of purpose within the CPPs that there should have been and there needs to be. This bill will at least insist upon the members of the CPPs, health boards, SPS, would be coming into that as far as um, safe communities are concerned. But coming together and being required to undertake the same type of consultation, the same type of listening and the same type of learning as local authorities try to do. So there, there's a greater insistence here that we will and we can work together and work better and know that the agenda that we are setting and the outcomes that we're working towards, and those outcomes are being set nationally, that, that's one of the proposals in the bill, um, that those outcomes are being set and they are being properly addressed by the partners, all of the partners, not just one or two of the partners, all of the partners. And there has to be some real insistence on that. So I think it will improve um, as a consequence of this bill. If it's not improving, then questions need to be asked.